Professor Mary, uh, do please take a step back. There was a very simple equation here. When epidemiologists modeled out how many humans this virus could have killed absent of the, the lockdowns, they should have had very clear in mind how many humans these lockdowns will kill in the long term on a country by country basis, and only then advise the governments on which was the lesser of these two evils. That meant working arm in arm with economists and the NGOs. But it didn't happen, did it? Uh, not that I'm aware of. It certainly, individual countries thought about what the lockdown would mean for them. And uh, But I, I agree that on a global basis, I don't think there has been a country by country assessment. Well, that's pretty serious. Uh, well, let me let me let me uh, double down. The reality here is that because of 35 years of governments cuts, cuts, and cuts to health services in the West, particularly now the developing nations and the poorer sections of our societies have to endure governments lockdowns that were purely aimed at not crushing the same hospitals that governments depleted so badly. Uh, but the consequent economic catastrophe of this may kill in developing nations and among our disadvantaged way more than this virus will ever do. Is this defensible as an epidemiologist? That's a really difficult question. I mean, we don't actually have a good idea of how uh, far, what the consequences of, of um, proceeding letting this epidemic run its course without these kinds of social distancing measures. So, you know, the, we, we think the basic reproductive number of the uh, COVID-19 is about two to two to three, two to 2.5, which means that if you did nothing, if you did no social distancing, no isolation, that somewhere between 70%, 60, 70% of the world would eventually get this disease. So what would that mean in terms of deaths, right? It would be extremely high. All the uh, hospitals would be overwhelmed in most countries. And that, that, um, that overwhelming of the hospitals would have led to the same kinds of uh, constraints around people getting non-COVID related health care. So it's not as easy as, as saying, well, we should just not do lockdowns or that those lockdowns are only there to make sure that hospitals uh, uh, stay afloat. I mean, we need hospitals. And yes, we, we need a stronger health system and a stronger safety net across the board. Uh, but we also need hospitals to stay open um, and to be as minimally disrupted as possible. And the only way to, to, to make sure that they're minimally disrupted is by slowing down the epidemic spread of this disease. Yes, but if I, if I uh, am an Indian man or if I am one of those uh, 265 million people that are on the brink of starvation because of the disruption in, uh, in logistics and, and supply chains, you know, I, I look at Germany and say, well, look, you know, the Germans had pretty good hospitals and uh, nothing much happened there. To be honest, quite frankly, I also dispute the fact that uh, the real mort mortality rate is as high as you, as you said, because uh, we still don't know. So, you know, if I'm an Indian man or an African man, I would look at you and say, look, guys, you know, you should have made sure that you had proper hospitals before shutting the whole world down. That's not really so fair that I have to suffer now. And, and no one in the future will ever count the, 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 the deaths that these lockdowns will cause in, in the long term. They will not be known, for sure. But I think it's not as important whether we count them after the fact so much as what we do now. And uh, there's we, we absolutely need to be able to get medical care to people who don't have COVID-19. Uh, how we do that is going to take some innovation. We have to think about making sure that when people do come into the hospitals, they're not, that's not the place where people get infected. But we actually have to provide uh, care for people with cardiovascular disease, care for other infections, care, vaccinations for children, uh, you know, de attended deliveries so people, women don't die in childbirth. Absolutely. I think that uh, to the extent that that hasn't happened, it's an incredibly important thing to address. 
Uh, it's it's uh, again, and then we we stop here. But with with this question, uh, it's, it's two hundred and nineteen thousand deaths over. 7.7 .7 billion people and the world has been shut down and the economic consequences are incalculable. Uh, again, I, I don't know. I, it was probably, as I said, it, this should have been modeled with the economists and the NGOs. Sorry if I insist, but it was a tragic mistake. Well, if you want, we I can go to the next question. <laughs> okay. Which is more like, I don't know, so it's up to you. Go ahead. Um, well, okay, um, herd immunity now, that's a very important issue. On the 4th of April, the Times of London reported Professor Graham Medley, the British government's uh, chief pandemic modeler, uh, saying that, I quote, natural herd immunity must be reconsidered as an option now. Uh, less than a month earlier, both the top medical and the scientific, um, the top medical and scientific advisors to the British government, Professor Whitten, Sir Vallas, had flirted with the same idea. Uh, given the serious uncertainties surrounding the vaccine, given the fact that a virus like this one will not go away by itself and can actually badly mutate, it could be that these British experts were right after all. It could be. And if so, uh, would you, epidemi epidemiologist, ever publicly admit it, that in the end it will be natural herd immunity to get us all out of this mess, or would you fear public panic? Uh, I don't think that's the option, to admit something or to fear public panic. I think that herd immunity could, would come with a, a huge number of deaths, and I think that's what people are trying to avoid. In order to get to the 60 or 70 percent of the world that would have to be infected, in order for us to see a decline uh, to, to minimal transmission, there's going to be, if, 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 if 70 percent of the world is infected and say 1 percent of those people die, that's a huge number of deaths. So that's what people, it has nothing to do with public panic, it has to do with counting deaths. But uh, I do think that some kind of herd immunity is going to be what, what matters here, and I hope that that's going to be mediated by a vaccine. Uh, one of the problems with herd immunity is that people are born into the susceptible state. So they re, the, the herd immunity depends on the whole population having a certain proportion of people who are immune. But over time, immune people die, and people who are not immune are born. And in this case, it may be that uh, immunity wanes over time. And so herd immunity will drop over time. And if there are still cases of this infection in the community, we're just going to see further waves of disease later. So I, without a vaccine that's going to really push us to over the top of the herd immunity uh, levels that we need, and without the ability to continuously vaccinate new people born into the susceptible state, I really don't see that as a long-term solution. All right. Uh, then you would mentioned vaccines. Uh, let me quote uh, to you this um, quote. The first important thing is to demonstrate that a vaccine is effective at uh, generating a neutralizing response. Then that has to be scaled to a large enough cohort of the population to show that it doesn't induce any bad side effects. I think there are examples where vaccines are completely ineffective. Some vaccines cause this antibody-enhanced effect that can be life-threatening and cause death in some cases. Do you know who said this? Uh, no, uh, it's David Walt from Harvard. And, and these are words that are pretty serious coming out of uh, Harvard. Uh, do you endorse them? Do I endorse his words? Uh, I don't think it's a question of endorsing or not endorsing the words. Uh, vaccines do. I'm, I'm not sure what you what you're what you're um, looking for as a response, but oh, no, no, I'm looking yeah. for any particular response. Well, uh, I'm neutral. I'd rather <coughs> speak for myself than endorse somebody else's words. So vaccines do need to be tested. Uh, they are being tested now. They will need to be scaled up. We're thinking uh, uh, about how uh, 
vaccine trials can be done in an expedited way once these vaccines are available. Uh, it is possible that there will be antibody-mediated um, uh, enhancement, but at the moment, there's not a lot of evidence that that's going to happen with this with these vaccines. The um, you know it, we, it's, it's certainly worth finding out, but I think the implication that vaccines aren't going to be a solution to uh, this problem is 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 it's possible they will not be long lasting. It's possible that they will produce um, antibody dependent enhancement. But it's also fairly likely that they will be useful, and it's, uh, I, I don't think the implication that that's not going to be a solution is correct. I think that uh, we do need to develop vaccines, and we need to make them in a way that, that are, they are safe. Uh, let me specify that there was no implication on my part that vaccines are not part of the solution. Uh, okay. I didn't imply that. Uh, it, we are to, towards the end. Italian politicians here are debating in Parliament, well, not in Parliament, but mandatory vaccinations for this virus. Don't you think that before forcing everyone to be inoculated, governments must at the very least know, A, the real mortality rate of COV-2 that may turn out to be, may turn out to be puny, uh, a lot more about our real immune response to COV-2 and explore whether pursuing an aggressive treatment strategy may be a much better investment than relying on these pretty shaky vaccines. Well, the vaccines don't exist yet or they're just being developed, so I'm not sure that we can call them shaky. Uh, I, I'm questioning where where that actually comes from. Well, they what, have a history of being from? pretty shaky. Uh, say I'm sorry? The, they have a history of being pretty shaky. You know, the flu vaccine has to be changed over and over and over. There's no vaccine for the cold. There's no vaccine for HIV. Uh, you know, there, there, there's, there is a history of vaccines not being all that perfect, you know. So, as I said, you know, uh, there's so many uncertainties about this virus and how it will develop that wouldn't investing on treatments rather than putting all this money into vaccines, you know, be a better choice? Well, you're bringing up several different points. Uh, first of all, there are some, it has been difficult to make a generalized flu vaccine, uh, but that has to do with the way flu mutates. And it's a very different organism from this coronavirus, which we don't know that much about. We, um, uh, there are very solid vaccines to other viruses. Measles has been, uh, vaccine is extraordinarily effective, uh, has had a huge impact on child mortality, as have many other vaccines. So I don't, if you're implying that all viral vaccines are shaky, I think that's fundamentally flawed. Uh, some of them are, are less uh, efficacious than others, but until we actually find out whether this vaccine or the vaccines that are being developed are, are work well, there's no way to call them either good or, or shaky. So I, 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 I think we need to wait and see what happens with the vaccine development there. But I do want to stress that child mortality has declined enormously in, in very much in part to, due to vaccines. The second part is about uh, whether they should be required. Uh, really, again, that depends on individual countries' dynamics. So to the extent that herd immunity has already, we've gone some way towards herd immunity in some countries. Italy has been heavily affected. I don't think we know what the seroprevalence is. I don't think we know what proportion of the population has been infected already. But uh, the question of whether governments should require vaccines. I don't think we're at a place to, to even think about it when we don't have a vaccine that we that is effective yet. Uh, and then your last question about whether it would be better to, to um, invest in treatment uh, solutions rather than vaccines. A lot of, as you I think pointed out, a lot of uh, in this, this infection does not result in serious clinical disease. So, but, but people are still infectious, and they can infect people who will become seriously ill. So, the, yeah, it will be very important to make sure that we have ways to treat people who are seriously sick. But we do know that just treat, treatment alone will not um, 
result in the kinds of reduction in infectiousness that would be required to really have an impact on the epidemic as a whole. So yes, I think we should be investing in treatment, but I don't think we should be investing in treatment at the expense of investing in some way to protect people for future generations and, and for this generation.